All right. Good morning. Oh yeah. So today, in our uh, quest for scientific computing, we're going to look at ordinary differential equations. Uh, they're a very co common um, equation to have to solve um, when you're simulating models. Um, so we're going to look at how to do that generally. So we're going to just look at some ordinary differential equations and see what kind of uh, things. Uh, we can use to solve them. And I want to look at two specializations if we have time. Um, regardless, this, the, the discussion is on the slides if you don't get to both of them. Uh, one is molecular dynamics, uh, a technique used to simulate things uh, from biomolecules to materials. Uh, and so it has a wide range of applications in the physical sciences and, and chemical physics. And another uh, important specialization is that of n-body gravity, um, when you're simulating uh, how, say, galaxies form, at least in a, a classical approximation or semi-classical approximation. Uh, that's another important specialization. And I mention them specifically because the general techniques that you find if you just look up how to solve ordinary f differential equations in a numerics book, um, it's not that they do not apply to these two cases, but if you apply them, you would never get your work done. They're basically too expensive for these kinds of applications. So, so you need techniques to balance your accuracy versus your speed, uh, which is the whole trick of high-performance computing. So we're going to look at those at the, at the end. Um, but let's look at the general uh, ordinary differential equations first. Um, so an ordinary differential equation is ordinary because you only take the derivative with respect to one variable. And typically, I will call this variable time here. Uh, so have in mind that there is a, an equation that tells us what the time derivative is of some variable x, uh, given the value of x and whatever time we're at. Uh, we'll actually not consider any time-dependent functions of f, but this is the most general form. Um, and uh, while t is just one variable, one scalar, x could, in principle, be a number of different variables. It could be a vector that has several components. And this is covered by the same general form. Uh, obviously, it becomes more complex, but the form is the same. So we could have more than one. So for instance, if I have a uh, two-component vector x with components x1, x2, then I could have two uh, right-hand side functions, f1 and f2, that depend on x1, x2, and possibly the time itself. Um, so uh, it could be uh, given in a slightly different form where you have a higher order derivative. This will be uh, very common uh, when we're looking at equations of motion uh, of particles. Uh, so the second derivative with respect to time might be some force, or uh, if this is a position, some acceleration. That actually does fall under the same class as the first one. Uh, by defining uh, two new variables, x1 uh, is just our old x, and x2 is the First derivative with respect to time, it's not hard to see that we actually get a set of equations for this x1 and x2, where we, we enforce that the x1 dt is, is x2 and the x2 gets the f. So a set of first order uh, derivative equations with just one variable, that's all we need to look at. That's the general case. And so when we're looking at solving ordinary differential equations generally, and so what we'll do for these is we're going to say, okay, let's, let's uh, prepare our system, the system being x, into some state. We'll give it a value. And then we want to know if that's the value at time 0, or whatever I want to call that time, but that's called at time 0. Uh, what is it after a certain amount of time, um, if it has to satisfy that equation? Okay. So here's some examples. Uh, I try to make uh, a somewhat broader uh, set of examples than just taking this from physics, uh, although my final examples will be that. Um, in ecology or ecologic uh, modeling, you could, uh, this is sort of a, a not a, I wouldn't say a standard model, but it's a frequently used model just to explain uh, things that can happen in predator uh, prey models. X, I think, is a predator and Y is prey. It's called the Lotka Volterra equation. And with certain parameters of alpha, beta, gamma, delta, you can get. Um, you can see the prey being eaten by predators that then starve because there's no more prey and it gets into a cycle. This is described by uh, a differential equation like this, the two variables x and y. Um, if you are a physicist, then you should all love the harmonic oscillator. 
And so this is, the, in its simplest form with all uh, parameters set to 1, is its simplest equ uh, equation. Uh, the x dy is y, y dt. Um, we're going to look at that in a little while, but x you can think of as the uh, position of a, a pendulum, or the, how far it gets, gets out of center, and uh, y could be its velocity. And so um, that would make the first uh, uh, equation make sense, that the time derivative of the position is the velocity, and the last says that the, the force on that uh, pendulum is uh, opposite and directed towards the center. So we will actually get some swinging. Uh, rate equations are another example from chemistry uh, that are often uh, often follow uh, ordinary differential equations. X, Y, and Z here could be concentrations of different species of different chemical uh, species, and uh, and K1, K2 could be different rate equations, and there's some chemical reaction going on. Um, so there are two. You can have ordinary uh, differential equations and. There's even a very simplex, simplistic weather system called Lorentz uh, system. Uh, again, three variables. They have something to do with pressure and temperature. It's very simplified in this case because you know, it pretends like temperature and pressure do not vary. Uh, so it's not a very, very good model of, of the weather. But what this one does very nicely is show that even if you simplify your weather models as much as you can to these three ordinary differential equations, you would actually see that you cannot predict this weather. Uh, this is a chaotic system, and no matter how hard you try, after, like with the finer precision of your initial condition, you can only predict a certain uh, time ahead of... of, of uh. So whether that uh, ice storm is really going to come today or not, uh, the fact that that's not so sure, it can somehow be linked to the behavior of, of general weather uh, models, and this is, this is a quintessential uh, example. So they happen all over the place. They're, they're, uh, whenever you don't have any spatial dependence uh, per se, you will typically have an ordinary differential equation, and that's what we're going to try and solve. So let's go back to this general form. In this case, I've made it more explicit that um, the, uh, I could have several components of x, so i is here an index. Um, what are we going to do to solve this? We're going to do something that we almost always do when we look at computers. Uh, this is a f, is, f and x are supposed to be smooth functions of x, so they're continuous. Um, and they have a value for every t. Uh, we can't handle functions that have a value for every uh, point on the real axis because we'd need, we would need infinitely many points and infinitely long time to compute that. So we have to discretize. We have to make this into something that's just a bunch of points, maybe a lot of them, uh, and somehow we approximate this continuum with a discrete model. That, um, we will get some errors there. Uh, Marcelo already hinted to discretization errors uh, in the last lecture, and we'll see them here again. Uh, but that's what we will have to do. So we're going to take uh, the approach that we want to evaluate the right-hand side as few times as possible um, at some discrete time points, t0, t1, etc. Um, and using those evaluations of f, we want to compute uh, what our next x is. So we will specify an initial condition x i t0 again. So this is our initial time. And then probably evaluate f on the right-hand side and then see what we have to do with that. Uh, now, we can do this in different ways, but um, the most straightforward way would say, we would say, well, we just compute, we try to compute a a solution or, or a value for x every, let's say, one second, in the case of, of the, uh, the predator-prey model, for instance. Every one second, we try to compute this. Um, that's taking a fixed time step. It's often not the best way to go about, because um, the size of your time step is going to determine your discretization error. And what time step is appropriate to get that discretization error small uh, depends on your system, but also depends on where your system is. You could imagine that perhaps if I have a pendulum, it uh, depends uh, more when I'm almost at the top, I would have to take my time set smaller than in the bottom where it might not so matter so much. In the top, it's going to matter whether I go left or right uh, very, very uh, sensitively. So typically what you do is you try to make an adaptive time step. You're going to try and find what the sensitivity is of your system as you go along and you adapt your time steps. Okay, so that's going to be the general approach and let's, let's look at a few 
specific ways on how we could do this. Um, before I do that, I should say that you'd always have to be a little bit careful just using uh, uh, canned procedures to solve ODEs. Some ODEs are typically are, are, are hard to solve just sort of inherently. Um, they might have several uh, time scales of different orders of magnitude working at the same time. Uh, such ODEs are often called stiff ODEs, although the really only uh, definition of stiff ODEs is that they are hard to solve. Uh, but it's, it's good to know that, that you have to be a little bit careful with canned solutions. Does your solution make sense? Uh, does it satisfy some of the properties you know? You always have to check this uh, when you're using these, these uh, algorithms. Okay, so we're going to look at this, the most simplest way to, uh, to solve an equation, uh, an, o, an ODE, using what's called forward Euler. We're going to take the equation again, and we're going to take a time step by taking our old value, uh, the, the nth value, uh, taking uh, the value of f, the right-hand side, at that time and at that xn, and multiply it by h, where h is the time step, so the difference between tn plus 1 and tn. And then we're just adding that here. Why? Because if we do a Taylor expansion of the real value, we'd find that up to order h squared, um, this would be true. So if h is small enough, if our time step is small enough, we would expect that at some point we can probably neglect this last term and have this as a decent approximation. This is the way you derive any of these algorithms. You basically do a Taylor expansion and you try to make, it sh make sure that things work. Um, just sometimes you're a little bit more careful than this very straightforward way. Uh, why would you have to be careful? Well, um, first let's see that this, this last term here is called the local error. It's called the error in one time step. Okay, so every time I make a step, I make a, an error of the order of h squared. And of course, it's true that if h is small enough, it becomes smaller, but I don't really know what the prefactor is. Who here is familiar with this order O notation? Okay, so most of you have seen this. So, so it, it scales as h squared, but I don't know what the prefactor is. That actually really depends on the system, and uh, we can't really know what it is until we might do a next expansion. But, uh, okay, so that's a local error, and I'm calling this a local error because there's also a thing called a global error, um, which comes from the fact that if I want to integrate this equation of motion from t1 to t2, so I have a fixed time interval, and I take a time step h, then the number of these steps I'm taking is inversely proportional to h, which means I make this error order 1 over h times. And so the global error is the number of steps times this, the error in each step is of the order of h. So it's not as, it, it's, it's second, they call it second order, but that's only per time step. It's really first order in what you can expect in terms of accuracy in the, the only uh, adjustable parameter you have here, which is the time step. So we don't expect it to be very, very accurate, but no, we didn't try too hard. We did the first simplest thing. What's more concerning about this order scheme is that it's not very stable. And what I mean by that is, let's, let's look at our harmonic oscillator. Um, since this is a fix, physics course, um, it should be able to handle at least the harmonic oscillator, which we can solve exactly. So. Um, so here it is again, now written out in its components x1 and x2 instead of x and y for some reason I changed notation. But in any case, because it's a linear system, if I, pro if I take this Euler equation, sorry, the Euler uh, uh, algorithm, uh, what I get as a relation between the next point and the previous point is just basically a matrix operation. So if I think of x1 and x2 as a vector, then I apply this matrix and I get the next point. And that's nice because I can also solve that exactly if I wanted to. Uh, what happens if I do this, I'm going to look at the stability of this, is, well, I have to look at the eigenvalues of this matrix. If the eigenvalues are larger than 1 in absolute value, then this will explode. If they're uh, uh, less than 1, it will shrink. Um, that's kind of how it works with these eigenvalues. Um, so this is what happens in this case. So I started out, and you should know this, uh, I didn't point this out, but I started out my trajectory in this point here, 0, 1, I guess, roughly, not quite. And it, what happened to the solution, if, I'm plot, if I plot this, uh, and the time steps are pretty small here, but so it looks smooth, um, is that it spirals out. It's, it basically 
show some sign of instability. And now usually if you get an instability like that, you go, okay, I probably took my time step to be too large. Um, because you now this can happen. You, you go too large, uh, all kinds of things go, go wrong. I want my discretization error to be small. I probably make it smaller and it won't get this instability. But that's not true. Um, the eigenvalues of this little matrix here are 1 plus or minus ih, which means the absolute value of these guys is the square root of 1 plus h squared, which is always bigger than 1. Doesn't matter how small I make my h, my, my time step, this is always an unstable system. Okay? So what we see is this order method, the simplest thing we could do, is essentially no good here. Um, you could try the second order, and it's still going to be unstable. Um, but there are ways to get around this. So um, one way to get around this in this case is it, you could imagine that what we did is, okay, we, we took the, the approximation um, where we added h times the function of t x n, and we got an, an instability. It grew. Uh, essentially exponentially. And that's because I compute the next point from the previous point. What if I compute the previous point from the next point? Well, it's hard to imagine how you would do it, but if you did it, this spiral would go the other way. So what if I go halfway? I'm going to take a midpoint approach where I say, well, I'm going to try and compute this function f, the right-hand side, not at the point where I'm at, but at the midpoint between where I'm at and where I'm going to be. Now, this does pose a little problem because now uh, on both sides of this equation, I have xn plus 1. So I do have to solve this equation for xn plus 1. Um, but if I managed to do that, I would imagine that this would get rid of any of these, this sort of drift because I'm not going either one way in, in time or the other way. So there's no way that there could be a, a preference for a spiraling in or out. And hopefully the, th the thing will stay in place, it will be stable. So this is an example of an implicit formula, just to show you that it will, will work for the harmonic oscillator. Uh, let's forget about the algebra. Uh, you get another matrix M now, that is the relation between the previous and the next point. Its eigenvalues are a little bit more, more uh, involved, uh, but it turns out that the, uh, the magnitude of, those, of both eigenvalues of this 2x2 uh, two two matrix are 1, and so this is stable for any H. So now, now we went... Um, uh, so that, that's kind of nice, and if you need to uh, plot it, it looks kind of like this. <laughs> this plot is not nearly as interesting, but it is a lot more desirable. Uh, the point is now going around in circles indefinitely. Very nice. Um, and so you'll often find uh, that implicit methods are more stable and, and as, as such allow a larger time step uh, than, uh, than non-implicit methods. Okay. Yes. The cost is that you have to solve this equation. Now, in this case, for the harmonic oscillator, it's a linear equation, and we can actually just do it with a little bit of matrix algebra. Um, if f is some nonlinear function, what we uh, end up having to do is solve a nonlinear equation at each time step. So uh, we'll probably be computing f a few times more than we would do in the forward direction. But in this case, there's really no... Uh, uh, no other way around it because we will have an, in, an unstable system that doesn't. The most important thing is we can't, we can't simulate the real system. No matter how small we make our time step, this thing diverges, right? What we will want from a good, good integration method for our ordinary differential equations is that, um, yes, we'll have to take finite steps, but if we want our, our, our simulation to be more accurate, we just take smaller steps. We just go more carefully and we get closer. Um, the order method cannot do that, and so you should not use that for ordinary differential equations. Um, but the, mid, the midpoint order can do that. Now, there's, we'll look at a few other ones that can also do it that don't have to have this, uh, this particular implicit formula, um, but it's good to know that these, these exist. Okay? So, um, another way to try and get around this idea of, uh, of instability is to use so-called predictor-corrector methods. Uh, they used to be very, uh, very popular. Their, their, their popularity is waning a bit for a reason I'll, I'll explain in a second. But the idea was that you just try to compute a new, a new point. You just do it, do a forward Euler or something that looks like it, 
and then correct after the fact for the mistake that you've made. So you have some way to estimate how far you're off and you, you're correcting that. And so there's different ways you can do that. Um, you could call the runke gotta methods uh, to be in the, of the same sort of class. Um, what it does rather than this, this real correction is to try and compute midpoints. So it does a first step, it uses whatever that step gave into a next approximation and yet a next approximation, yet another one, and then combines all of those in some magic way uh, to get a fourth order uh, correct result, which also happens to be uh, just heuristically fairly stable. Uh, so many people like to use this as a out-of-the-box uh, uh, equation. It's not implicit, it's explicit, but it uses a whole bunch of midpoints to sort of get around uh, uh, this drift. It's not so clear why it works. Right? It's more of a, but we've seen that Euler does not work, so we stay away from that. So this is your out-of-the-box method. Uh, you do midpoints, it's kind of like you're correcting previous steps, and that's why it works. But uh, the algebra will tell you that this is uh, that why these are uh, uh, the numbers that they are. Not so important for us right now. Okay. Uh, what we did do so far, though, is only use uh, fixed time steps, right? The time step was the same. And so, in generally, this is not what you want to do. In generally, in general, you want to uh, adapt your time step. Um, and so, rather than uh, than taking a fixed age, you you vary it. And how do you know how to vary it? Well, um, there's different schemes, but in essence. You're going to take the same, the, the same step twice, once with a step h, step size h, and once with a step size h over 2, and you're going to compare if they're reasonably close. And if they're not, you're going to use h over 2 and try again, but if they're reasonably close, you take h and you go on. Um, that's kind of what you do. Now, it's kind of tricky to get this right, and so you don't want to code this yourself. What you want to do is use a library. So, in this part of the course where we're doing numerical tools for, uh, for, for different algorithms, we're basically going to show you a library to do the work for you, rather uh, than showing how you should implement these yourself. Um, this makes sense from your point of view because it, it doesn't waste your time uh, solving something, but it is... Uh, I experienced this myself when I started my scientific computing career, and I, I felt like I should... Ah, I'm a smart guy. I can program these things in. I can do an adaptive time step. I don't have to use a library. So it, you might feel almost a pride not using somebody else's code. Um, so I want to urge you to set aside that pride. Uh, yes, you might be smart, but uh, the people working on these libraries tend to have sort of a career of studying these numerical methods behind them. And so you have not, and chances are they did a good job. Uh, and if they didn't, you will find out, and you'll find it out in the literature. So let's reap the benefits of their, their research and their development. There's two libraries uh, for this particular case that you could use uh, quite, quite nicely. One is called a GSL, and the other is called Boost. And it's not the full GL, GSL. GSL stands for GNU Scientific Library. It is a, a bunch of different routines that can do a lot of things, uh, numerical things that happen a lot in scientific software. Uh, it's not always the most performing, but it is very solid. And so I'm going to look at an ex uh, example from that uh, for ODEs. But it has random numbers. It has a whole bunch of things. Um, if you don't have it on your system and you're not using Synet yet, it's not too hard to install, but that's, that's something you can try. Uh, the other one is Boost. We looked at Boost uh, briefly when we did the unit test. Um, uh, Boost has also a, uh, a sub-module for uh, ordinary differential equations called numerics ODE int. Uh, also not bad. Uh, this is obvious. Now, GSL is more C-based, so things are starting to have a C flavor, and Boost is more C++, but... Um, Either one will work. So here's an example of how, e how it works. And uh, we're not going to go in detail, uh, but the point of this slide is really, OK, you want to use the GSL um, or, or Boost. Uh, the only thing that, 
that I can guarantee you is that you have to read documentation. It's not just a single code or a single line saying, solve this equation for me, please. You have to set up some things. You have to uh, at least give it the equation of motion. So here there's a, a Van der Poel equation that is uh, defined by this, this, these right-hand sides, uh, F0 and 1, it's two components. Um, there's going to be parameters. There's going to be ways in which our solver, which is this ODE uh, driver, uh, needs some uh, inputs in terms of the arguments, uh, the definition of the system, uh, what kind of uh, algorithm to use. Here's RK, there's where Runga Kanta is buried in this case, and some tolerances. So this is going to be adapt adaptive. Uh, what you're going to say is, I want my solution to be accurate in one part in a million, for instance, that's 10 to the minus 6 there. Um, and that's what it's going to try and do. So it's going to do this time step, half time step, see if they agree within 10 to the minus 6. And if so, it continues on. If not, it decreases the time step. And every now it will increase the time step. All of that, you don't, so that, that stuff you don't have to do, but you have to pass it all these things. And then, uh, then you essentially are going to uh, time step over it. Uh, the driver will do the adaptive stuff. So the nice thing about this is that you can get a result that is equally spaced in time, even though the algorithm didn't do it that way. So it will solve them for the points that it wants, interpolate between, and give you the impression like you have everything every second, uh, which, is, which is probably a nice way to have it as an output, easier to, to interpret it after. Uh, but it's not how it's computed, because it might have needed the point at a second and a half, and then three quarter seconds uh, further, etc. So I'm as I said, I'm going to go into this in detail. There is some work in getting this to work. Just read the documentation. There's a lot of examples. This is just straight out of the DSL documentation. The DSL is very well documented, so it's not a real, uh, really a big, big deal. Uh, but because it's a C library, it all works with like pointers and some casts, and it's a little bit, it's a, it might be a little bit clunky. You can look at Boost too, which um, is, is clunky for different reasons, but at least it's, it's proper C++. Okay. Questions about the ODEs? Uh, no, no, the predictor correctors aren't so popular. Runcada uh, still has a good popularity uh, um, because it does it in small step. What can go wrong in predictor corrector is that um, you're taking a step forward and now you're correcting. And uh, what can happen is, especially when your first step was already fairly good, is that the correction you have to do, you're basically subtracting two almost perfect. Uh, uh, perfectly good numbers from each other. And when you, when you subtract two numbers that are of similar order, you get this numeric cancellation where you're losing bits. And so what can happen if you try to push these predictive corrector methods too far, if you start saying, I want 10 to the minus 9, you're going to find this, you, you're not getting there. And you start taking smaller, smaller time steps and your accuracy doesn't improve because you have this cancellation. So, um, so that's, that's why if you really try to push the limits, they are, they're not and, and there are alternatives, which you will see actually uh, uh, soon, uh, to, uh, to not having to do this. Because you really do it for stability more than anything. Um, they're still great for this kind of order of magnitude. Um, you want a rough idea of how things look. They're not bad, uh, but, um, but that's, that's why. Uh, are the eigenvalues actually or I don't. Approximate. Does it matter or like have a large time? In, I haven't done the, the math for the harmonic oscillator in this case, but in general, since the f is going to be a nonlinear function, that the eigenvalue of the matrix varies as you go along. And right. so it just hap depends on what region you. you there will be parts where it is larger than one, but then it won't spend perhaps much time there. Uh, so it's a, it's a real balance in that, right. in that sense. So, so I think this is, I have to remember, I think it is local. I think it is local. It's per time step, yes. And so one is relative and one is absolute. Um, I specify, like, that's why it, said, it says it there twice. But uh, yeah. I forgot what the zero is. It's something else. Anyway. OK. So let's look at some special cases where 
you would not do it that way. So let's uh, tackle molecular dynamics first. So at first sight, uh, molecular dynamics, which is really something used a lot in, in chemical physics, material science, and biomolecules. Uh, you take a, point, a, a bunch of particles, points, atoms, molecules, protons, I don't know. Um, and uh, you pretend like they, uh, they satisfy essentially Newton equations. So uh, mass times acceleration is the force, which could in principle depend on positions and velocities and time. Um, you typically, most of the time, you only see uh, and R depends, the force depends on the, part, the particle's positions, but you could make this more general. Um, so you have N particles, and they're just interacting through these forces, and you want to see how they evolve. So uh, that's just an ODE. It's second order, but we can write it as a set of two uh, first order differential equations. And, and so why is this different? So um, a few things make this a little bit different. Uh, some are good, and some, some are complicating. Um, but the first thing is that it, these are, well, come to Newton equations or Hamilton equations. These equations typically conserve energy. That is to say, there's an energy associated to this system. If you compute it, it should not grow. It should not, not decay. It should stay the same. Uh, why is that good? That means that you have a nice way of tracking stability. See, in the harmonic oscillator, we know that things should just go in a circle. Uh, and then... Uh, if they don't, we see this wrong. But if we don't know what the system is supposed to do, um, we don't know if we're not seeing periodic behavior because it's unstable, or we're not seeing it because it wasn't there in the system to begin with. By having an energy function, we have a way of sort of tracking the, st the, the stability of our system. We can see, okay, our simulation, is the energy increasing, is it decreasing, or is it staying the same? And if it's, if it's decreasing or, 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 or increasing, we've done something wrong. So that's a, kind of a nice thing, but it also so means that we would really like to see this stability in the energy. Uh, we don't want to just use any old system, uh, any old method that might not be sensitive to that. So we. Oh yeah, this should have the, uh, the J. You're right. Yes. yes. Um, the the next part that makes this quite different is that you typically have a lot of particles, which means that if every particle is allowed to interact with every other particle. Um, the evaluation of this right hand side, this f function, becomes very expensive. So, whereas uh, if you just throw out, throw in a uh, Rango Kata with it and that of time step, even if it did, did do it, we'd have to have a small time step and um, what is it, four force evaluations per every step. Uh, that becomes just a lot, of, uh, a lot of time spent in force evaluations, evaluations of f. Um, and uh, we'd like to avoid that. And secondly, you typically need large simulation times for these kinds of systems. We are not really after the, the, the motion of the molecules on, say, a nanosecond time scale. Uh, we are probably looking at uh, how a, uh, a protein can go through a, a membrane, which is a cell membrane or something in biophysics. Or we might want to look at, um, well, let's look at the, 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 the other side of the scale. Um, how a galaxy forms uh, in, in many uh, millions of years, um, whereas the, the evolution of these points is probably on a much smaller time scale. So we want large, large time scales to see what's going on. And so while these are ordinary differential equations, they're not so ordinary that we can use ordinary methods. A, a little bit more about this idea of having, uh, having Hamiltonian equations or Newtonian equations. I use the Two terms here, uh, uh, as if they are the same. They are not. Uh, if you're mathematically inclined, don't attack me after. I know the difference, but uh, for our purposes, the idea that you have uh, an energy that's conserved, which might be of this form, uh, something kinetic and something potential, where the force derives from a potential energy, uh, would imply that our forces are all pairwise forces. So I have n particles. Every particle can, can experience a force from another particle. Uh, that's n squared over 2, or n times n minus 1 over 2 interactions to compute. Um, and, um, and that for every, every time step. Okay? 
and that forms the right hand side of our equation. So that's what makes this expensive. We have a lot of interactions to compute every time we want to take a time step. We have some other issues. Uh, say we do want to know how this, uh, this membrane uh, and, and protein interact. Uh, surrounding that is probably a whole bunch of water. Now, um, that makes the number n grow very, very rapidly, very, very quick. And we have to because you know, that's, that's the reality. Uh, but often we're going to try and mimic the idea of, uh, of an infinite system or a very large system by using as, as few uh, particles as possible. And one way to do that is to, uh, to use periodic boundary conditions. So the idea here is that um, rather than taking infinitely many points, which the computer has trouble with, uh, we take a finite number and we essentially replicate that over this sort of checkerboard kind of uh, idea. So every point here is replicated, every particle is replicated infinitely many times in concept. But we only store the ones in the middle. And what that does is it makes it seem from one of these particles, especially if there's quite a few particles in the, in the red cell as well, it makes it seem as if there's pretty much an infinite system or a system of which it cannot see the boundary. As soon as you put a real boundary in your system, um, like a wall, um, these particles are going to behave differently because they bounce off that ball all the time. Um, so I don't want that. Uh, so I want to pretend like I have a near infinite system by doing this uh, rather than having a wall. If I don't put a wall or anything, they'll just escape to infinity. So that's not good either. So, so this is very typical for when you try to simulate something that's in a liquid state, um, where you might not care too much exactly where these particles are, but you do want them to see an infinite bath. Well, um, since they are all the same, I could say that the energy of this box itself must be conserved as well. Right, and then times infinity, but that's, <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. So you're going to keep track of the red box. The rest are called periodic images, which we will deal with in the algorithm, but which, uh, which don't really exist as separate things. Yeah. So what you would do, for instance, if a particle leaves the box, it has to enter the other box, because then it's as if this guy is, is moving in. And whenever I have a guy here, I have to make sure that it feels the force from, from that guy on the other side. Because that's what I remind. Like, the They're all the same. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. You assume that this is this is uniform. Otherwise, if it's not good enough, you might have to make the red box a bit a bit larger, and then. Uh, but it's still better than most other uh, ways of doing this. Um, I put up here a typical um, uh, force or potential between two particles. So I said, every two particles feels this, this potential. This is the energy between two of them. Um, and it kind of looks like the, the right side here. Um, there's two curves you can see. There's a third curve that uh, doesn't really matter. Um, there's a blue and purplish curve. Uh, the purplish curve, you can see that this, this interaction sort of dies off as the two particles so on the axis here is R, which is the separation of the two particles, of any two particles. As they get further and further away, they interact less and less. The, the, the mutual uh, attraction gets less and less. But it is still there. And so what you would do to try and fix this problem of having n squared, order n squared operations, is you'd say, well, you know, instead of computing this, or whatever is your real, your real potential, let's cut it off. Let's just say, well, after this point, it's enough. I just say that this is zero. So we just set it to zero after a certain cutoff, and, and we smooth it out a bit by shifting the, the curve and make it, make it neatly attach. Uh, what that does is that rather than having to do n times n minus 1 over 2 interactions, um, I only have to do the interactions for each particle and its, its surrounding for how many ever particles fit within this cutoff rate. Right? So that's a finite number. Uh, hopefully, the cutoff radius can be taken much smaller than the the size of the system. And so that makes the computation from an order n squared operation to something that's order n. n times a large number, however many particles are in its environment, but not as many as in, are in the system. Um, how do you find which particles are close? Because if I have to look at all of the particles every time, uh, then I'm still considering n squared pairs. So you're going to uh, so basically 
prune the pairs by looking at all of the pairs, all of the particles, and, and dividing them up into, into cells, um, and then see where the particles are in cells, and then particles in one cell will only consider particles in neighboring cells. It's a trick, but it's a common trick, and so if you're going to do MD, you know that this trick is, exists. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help you, because otherwise, yes, you're not computing n squared forces, but you're still computing n squared distances to see if they are within the cutoff, and you still have this, this same issue. Um, there's a further uh, um, sort of technique that helps you further, which, which I won't discuss right now, but uh, what I do want to discuss quickly is the idea of a uh, of the of um, good qualities. Oh, yeah, sorry. Right, that's, which is why you have to make sure that this force really is smoothed out. So you don't just stop considering them. You, you, so, so the idea is you smooth out so that whenever they're near the edge, the interaction is already zero. Right, so so your, your cells have to be bigger than the cutoff, essentially. And as long as you make sure that that happens, um, you're safe. Yeah, you, do, you have to do cross cells, but only the next cell, but not the next, next cell. And so that's how it becomes a finite uh, number of particles to do. Yeah. So neighbor lists do, do a similar thing, but keep that a little bit more than them. Uh, so suppose we want to, to simulate this, this system. Uh, we might want to, uh, we, we want a, a whole bunch of things that we can't all have. We want accuracy, efficiency, stability. And we wanted to respect physical laws. If the energy is conserved in our system, it better stay the same. Um, there's variations on doing this, where rather than keeping the energy constant, you might keep a pressure constant or a temperature constant. But yet, yeah, you want these things to be constant. So you want to have a, an integration scheme that can, can do that. And maybe, especially if you're looking at, at astrophysics, you probably want to have not just conservation of energy, you probably want your linear momentum and your angular momentum to be, uh, to be conserved. If you're thinking of statistical physics applications and you want to do an ensemble average, it turns out that it's very important to have this conservation of phase space volume, uh, which guarantees that if you take the average over a time trajectory, you get your, uh, your ensemble average. So you want this large possible time step while keeping these things uh, uh, more or less in check. And to do that, um, you can use what are called symplectic integrators. And why they're called symplectic, I won't tell you. Um, and, and how you can tell that they are, I will also not tell you. But you should know that they exist. Uh, and that they're actually not necessarily that complex in its, in its simplest scheme. Uh, here's a simple example that's called after uh, Follet, who uh, came up with it. Um, you're going to take steps. So you mentioned here uh, P is the momentum. So that, that's essentially the second variable, and R is the position. Uh, you essentially use your high school knowledge to advance to one time step. Um, t and t squared are here, and the acceleration is here, where you have the forces computed at some point. Um, and then you do that first, and then you compute the momentum. So it's kind of funny. You, you update the, the positions first, and then you update the, uh, sorry, you update the positions first, and then the velocities. Kind of. And you use this midpoint idea here again of having the forces averaged. Now, the reason that this is not implicit is that uh, if your force only depends on the positions, then you've just computed the new positions. So you have your new force. So this is a nice way to get an implicit method becoming explicit. Um, but it is because we're doing it in two steps. Uh, you usually write it a slightly different way, where you, uh, you take half steps of the momentum first, then a full step of the position and a half step moment. Um, these two are equivalent, but what's kind of nice about this one, it turns out, is that it, you can pretend like you're taking the steps at the same time. Um, so your Pn and your Rn are, are at the same time. And it becomes, that's the, that becomes important if you're tracking energy. Um, if you track the energy with this formulation, uh, P would be a half step off, in essence. And so your energy would be fluctuating more than it really is. It'll be stable, but, but fluctuating. Uh, here, uh, the P and R after one of this combined three-step step, step uh, would would sort of make physical sense. Are you saying R and one the side down? 
Sorry. Yeah, so these, so these guys correspond, but the P1 half is kind of what you're really computing here. Yes. So, so if you're only after positions, this is just as good a formulation. But if you want to track the energy, it also depends on the velocities, obviously, the kinetic part of it. Um, you're better off doing something like that. Or use this, and whenever you, you're computing the energy, do your half step for your positions, for your velocities, to, to make sure you write, you're right in what you're computing. Avoid yes, so this does, this does implicit without having to solve anything. It's a really nice way to do this. Uh, there's, uh, this is second order, and so it's not accurate, but it's very stable. Uh, and this is pretty much what everybody uses in molecular dynamics. Um, it's hard to get uh, any algorithms that can do larger time steps and be as stable and as accurate. Um, you can make higher order. Uh, you can get more accuracy by having higher order, but typically the accuracy is not the most important thing. Once you're at, I don't know, 10 to the minus 4 or 5, you're typically OK you're, you're in this field. Um, there's other fields where that is not the case, but for this field, that's the case. Now, I'll leave the, the astrophysics part for, for reading. Um, I'll promise not to put it in the, in the assignment. Uh, you might wonder, OK, so we're going to do libraries, aren't we? Um, where are the me molecular dynamics libraries? And there typically aren't any. Um, there's almost too many moving parts to do this. People either use a CANT package, an application, um, like Gromax or NAMD or LAMPS, um, all, all very good applications that, that you basically give a configuration file that specifies the forces, the particles, the type of particles you want. Some of them are good at chemistry. Um, uh, Gromax knows a lot about uh, force fields between different atoms. Um, some are more used in material science, like LAMPS. Um, and and you, you drive them that way. But all of these parameter files have all of these elements in them. You will be able to say what your cutoff is. You will be able to say how many particles you want, what the size of your box is. Uh, all of these things will be, will be in there, what algorithm you're using to do this. So it's good to know these things exist, to even to use these packages. Um, there are not many frameworks, but some of them do exist. Uh, OpenMM is a nice one out of Stanford. Um, I do find that most researchers, if they're not using one of the CAN codes, just write their own, which means there's a good bit of development going on, but maybe they have had this code in the group for a while. Uh, this, this does happen. Um, it was the case with my research, um, which is at least one way how I figured out so much about what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so it does exist, but it's not as common. Most people uh, are happy with the, the applications as they are uh, tuning the parameters of, their, uh, of the configuration. So, as I said, and body gravitation. This, this, this is about long range interactions, and so the case where you can't do the cutoff. So, you can read this through. It's important to, to, to because it's, it requires different techniques. You can't do this as nicely as we just discussed for uh, our Leonard Jones model. But, um, and especially for gravity, there's no way around it. Uh, there's techniques to help you get around this n squared force evaluation, and that's, that's what these these next few slides um, explain. Um, but you know, if, if, you, if you require these, your, uh, your group will help you out or come to me, and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about it too. But, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, the homework, by the way, was, was due tomorrow. So we'll just keep that one day skip from now on just to, you know, it doesn't make sense to have two assignments at the same time. Um, but yeah. Okay.